from it again. I find David a fascinating study. I find him fascinating because he had experienced the highest of the highs in this life as, as a little boy defeating the giant, as a, as a grown man building a great kingdom, and uh, in all those things, he, was, he, he proved himself to be a man's man, didn't he? And yet this one that the Bible calls the man after God's own heart, he knew what the depths of conviction were as well, and he knew how to live with sin in his heart without letting it be shown, apparently. And when I see some things here in this passage, I just think that every one of us needs to hear this all the time. There's a reason you read your Bible every day. Why is that? So that God can speak personally to you. The preacher's not trying to speak to you. The preacher doesn't know what's going on in your heart and life, Not certainly not all the time. Uh, you might share some burdens with him, but the Bible speaks of God speaking to us through his word, and we'll look at some things about that as well. But um, in Psalm 51, verse 17, now this is the great penitent psalm, but notice this. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Now, David considered just giving something to make up for his sin. It says in verse 16, thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. He would happily have sacrificed whatever he could just to have his fellowship restored. But that's not what God wanted. He wanted his heart to be changed. And you know what's missing so much of the time in people that profess to know the Lord Jesus Christ? That God hasn't had an opportunity to move on their heart. Excuse me one second. Tom usually does that. And uh, this thing gets moved around probably mostly by me. And I keep stumbling on it. And that's, uh, if you see me despair, it's because I did stumble on it. Okay, <laughs> anyway, um, when you look at David's life, a life he had miracles uh, all over his life, didn't he? In fact, when you look at your whole Bible, and I mentioned this Wednesday night, when some great uh, victories were won, it was because God intervened. It was a miracle from God. And we get through life right now. If you have a prayer life with God, then you'll be praying for God to give a miracle. I'm praying for a miracle for my friend Tommy and Elaine Bauckham, that God would get them off the drugs that the doctors have put them on. It takes a miracle to do that. And they won, mir they won by miracles. How did 185,000 soldiers die in the middle of the night? Because God sent his death angel, and one angel uh, put 185,000 men into eternity. No man did that. No man did that because God intervened. It was a miracle. How about the walls of Jericho? I mentioned that Wednesday night. How about the walls of Jericho? They fell down. I've never seen in all the military records I've read another time where the walls just fell down because they marched around the city. I've never seen anything like that, unfortunately. Miracles win battles, but sin changes lives, doesn't it? Think of the change that Achan brought to the children of Israel, but here it's David bringing change to the lives of these people, the man after God's own heart. Your Bible says in both Testaments that, uh, re, uh, that uh, revival has to begin in the hearts of God's people. I have no doubt revival began in David's heart right here. And as near as I can figure, this was probably somewhere around the time he took the throne over all the kingdom. Because uh, in Jerusalem, Solomon was born a year or two after he moved there. So uh, I suspect this was quite early in David's life, in, certainly as in his uh, kingship. And it changed his life forever, didn't it? And here you see in this verse, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. You see heart and spirit together, heart and spirit. You can say someone has a lot of heart when they, don't, when they won't go down in a boxing ring or they won't quit in a race or they won't quit in a football game. They, they, uh, they are better in the last quarter, the last few minutes than they were in the first part of the game. That's what heart is, but spirit's kind of similar to that, isn't it? The spirit has to be right as well. The man after God's own heart, really all of this illustrates fellowship with God. All of it illustrates fellowship with God. Now, fellowship on a horizontal plane, a lot of times kids kind of fall out of church. Why? They don't see kids their age that they can fellowship with as they serve God and worship God together. And that's sad, isn't it? But that's really not a reason to quit what's right. But what about your fellowship with God? 
Have you spent time with God already today? Do you have a prayer list where not only do you pray before God, but you can record when God gives you what you ask for, and you get strength from that and confidence, you get faith from that? This passage illustrates fellowship and the, the lack thereof. That's what heart health is all about, our fellowship with God. Let's ask God to bless us this morning. Let's pray. Lord, just bless this time. I'm not sure why you put this burden on my heart. You certainly did. I pray, Father, that you would take away the distractions, not only from my mind and heart, but from everyone else's as well, that your spirit might have free course in this place. We know, Lord, that uh, you can go through the motions with your heart wrong. You can go through the motions defending sin in your heart and hoping no one finds it, but your fellowship with God won't be right and your fellowship with God's people won't be right either. Lord, do a work in every heart today. We'll thank you for that in Jesus' name, amen. And isn't that a miracle when God works with one message, one man's words, and speaks to hearts all, all around? Why is that? Because God's word, just as these kids sang about, God's word is quick and powerful, and every word is pure, and all of those words that we sing about the words of God. Notice this diagnosis or the condition that he was praying from, that he wrote this psalm from. What was your condition? Well, if you diagnose your problems, just think about what you say as an excuse. What are your excuses today? In Psalm 50, if you go back one page maybe, Psalm 50 and verse 21, this sometimes is our biggest problem. It says, these things hast thou done and I kept silence. God's keeping silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such a one as thyself, but I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. You know where a lot of people go wrong? You figure God's forgetful like we are. You forget, you think that God overlooks some things. That's insignificant right there. It's not insignificant. It's not insignificant. He died for every sin. Every single one, didn't he? And sometimes you'll get caught up and you can excuse your behavior because, well, God's just like us and he understands we all have weaknesses and all of that. The Bible still tells us to pray for cleansing from secret sins, doesn't he? God's just like us. Sometimes in 50, look at Psalm 50, verse 20, it says this, Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother. You know, that's a terrible thing to speak against your brother. Thou slanderest thine own mother's son. Where does that happen? That comes probably when someone is trying to step on someone else to raise themselves higher. They're trying to go higher by putting someone else down. You see, a lot of times that's the whole heart of advertising, isn't it? Use me because I'm better than everyone else. Well, in a spiritual sphere, that's a different thing, isn't it? I guess it's the same principle. We are better than others if we slander them. And you slander people to make your sin that you're defending, if you are uh, doing this uh, intentionally, you make your sin look like it's common and not nearly as bad as someone else. We ignore permanent principles. We ignore the permanent for one thing. We ignore principles of God's word for another thing. The Bible speaks about walking by faith. How much do we walk by flesh or sight? The Bible speaks about uh, the fruit of the Spirit being love, joy, peace, all those things. We ignore the principles that we learned when we were younger. And why do I say all this? Because all these things were beat into David's heart. He knew good and well. I mean, if you go back to Psalm 50, this is uh, another psalm, a psalm of Asaph. This was one of the songs that was sung. And you know what they sing about? That our wicked heart slanders other. That, uh, that uh, God is just like us and so we can excuse our sin. Don't you know that David spent, let's just say in round figures, a year excusing his own behavior? He knew good and well that Uriah was his friend. He knew good and well that what he had done was take another man's wife. He knew good and well that while he sat, if before anything else happened, he sat at home at ease while his men went out and put their lives on the line. And then he fell into sin. He had to excuse it somehow, didn't he? He's not stupid. He's not ignorant. He had to think about that somewhere along the line, and that's exactly what you see in Psalm 51. We ignore the principles of life. 
In Psalm 49, look at this one. Psalm 49, really all the way through this book, verse 12, in this passage, verse 12, nevertheless, man being in, in honor abideth not. He's like the beasts that perish. Men don't do really well with the honor of other men because the very best of man is still going to go to a hole in the ground, right? Self-promotion. They, kept, they wanted to name their property after their own names. They wanted to promote themselves and build a legacy that they probably hadn't spent a lifetime building. They wanted to make people remember them, to notice them, and all of those things. And David had done plenty of things to do all of that, to be noticed. He was the man after God's own heart. But for at least a year, he, he let his heart get hardened. And even though he had done what is consistent with kings doing all the time, I mean, if you had a thousand wives, what's another one? Solomon had a thousand wives. He could, uh, he could just explain it away by, I'm a king, and men have great ways of explaining sin away, don't they? But he had to deal with this for a year, and you'll see what was missing, because when I say heart health is all about fellowship, his fellowship with God was gone. Is your fellowship with God as alive as it ever has been? It should be today. When you ask for God to give you peace, does he give you peace? When you ask for God to give you a burden uh, to preach, does he give you a burden to preach? He, we have all kinds of excuses, and I'd be interested to know what further excuses you could find in David's lives. But he, he lived through this time, didn't he? But I want you to look not only in diagnosing our problem, look at the reality, and this is from David's perspective. Notice in verse 2, wash me thoroughly. You know what's wrong with a man that doesn't have fellowship with God? He knows he's filthy and unclean, doesn't he? Say, well, I'm saved. My sins are all gone. Yeah, well, David was a man after God's own heart. And by the way, 1 John 1 says, if you say you have fellowship with him and you walk in sin, you're lying. Not only are you lying, you're trying to make God into a liar. Your fellowship with God, it begins the day you get saved. But from that time on, it's sweeter and sweeter. Isn't it interesting that God had all the men of Israel come together three times a year and enjoy a time of feasting? Three times a year. Do you realize that there's something very convivial, something very precious and something pleasant about people just feasting together? They're making plans for Thanksgiving Day already. Now, I don't really mind those plans. You know what I mean? And all the different things they're going to eat. And you know what we'll do? Our family and friends will get together and we'll sit around the table and we'll enjoy, I mean, the girls have spent days, even weeks, preparing all this stuff, whether it's mentally, and then finally they do it physically, and then we can consume it in 30 minutes that took them forever to, to make. But when we do so, we have the kids around the table, we have uh, loved ones around the table, and if the whole nation is feasting, you know, I, I, uh, I spoke with some folks in Boise, and uh, and I meant to get down there this last summer. It didn't work out for me, too. And I just have family and friends down there I'd like to see. I miss seeing them. I spoke to a friend in Canada, and I enjoyed speaking with them. I just enjoy getting together with people that love the Lord, and you can fellowship together. And God ordained that the children of Israel do that three times a year. Why? So that the fellowship amongst us would be great. You know, some of the greatest times we have is when we go from this place into the house, and we might have a pizza after church, and we just enjoy each other's company. And you know what was wrong with David? He could have all the people around him he wanted, but in verse 2, wash me thoroughly. He was filthy, and you can't approach to God filthy, can you? You just can't do it. Uncleanness, that is the presence of sin. Do you understand with David, he knew what joy was. He knew what joy was. What do you suppose a boy felt when he saw Goliath go down and he cut off his head? That boy, though he had never done that to any man before, as far as I can tell, that boy rejoiced because God had given a victory. He knew what joy was like. He knew what joy was like because of a victory in battle. And because of that, he knew what it was like to trust God for strength in that battle. And God came through. He knew victory, didn't he? You know, you know, uh, victory is by perseverance. You go through and you play when you hurt. If it's a, a silly game, 
You play when you don't feel like playing. You train when you don't feel like training. You work when you don't feel like working. And when you get that taste of victory, they, they counter that with the agony of defeat, especially when you get so close to winning and then you lose. David had tasted victory. And you know what he's, the first thing he speaks of is? Wash me, please. Wash me thoroughly. Wash me thoroughly. Paul, the counterpart in New Testament is Paul saying in Romans 7, who will deliver me from the body of this death because the things he wanted to do he didn't seem to be able to do and the things he hated are the things he inclined to. He felt an overwhelming sense of his sin, didn't he? And it robbed him of his joy. He knew victory. Look at 2 Samuel 23. This is also very interesting. 2 Samuel chapter 23 and verse 1 now, this is probably roughly 30 years after what we're looking at today. It says, now these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, and the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel, said, any one of those names would be sweet, wouldn't it? I wish I, wish I had the voice that people could call me the sweet singer of the church. And I'm not being funny. I've heard some people's songs, when, I've heard people's voices just thrill my soul. But they call David the sweet psalmist of Israel. He'd been raised up on high, all that. Verse 2, the Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. David knew inspiration. He knew God speaking to him to write these words down. You want to know what inspiration is? God gives him the very words to record. And now, with sin raising its ugly specter, you know what? He says, I'm just filthy and dirty. Cleanse me, O God. Please cleanse me. Uncleanness. Verse 7, it says, purge me with hyssop. Verse 10, create me a clean heart. You know, his filth was all the way through him. Why? Because it was sin. That's why he speaks of the spirit and the heart at the same time in our text today. The reality is uncleanness, uncleanness. You ask yourself right now, if it were life or death, and you bowed before God right now, what would God bring to your mind? The man of God's own heart comes before God and says, I'm unclean. Paul says in the New Testament, uh, who will deliver me from a body of this death? Verse 4, against thee, the only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. You know what that is? That is absolutely an awareness of broken fellowship. Absol only a phony can stab you in the back and then smile at you in your face. David knew his fellowship had been broken. David knew that. When you first got saved, every day was a beautiful new day, wasn't it? When you first got saved, you couldn't wait to tell someone else about Jesus. When you first got saved, you may not have had a voice, but you sang at the top of your lungs, didn't you? And David says this. David says uh, in verse 4, Against thee, thee only, have I sinned. Against thee, thee only. You know what children do? A little boy, what he does? He wants to please his dad. And when he sees that his dad's not pleased or that he's failed... He's so saddened. Isn't that the same way we should be with our Heavenly Father? Our fathers on earth gave us, uh, well, gave us lots of physical things, didn't they? Gave us our nature. Hopefully took us to church and we got saved there. But our Heavenly Father gives us so much more. And if you can look at your own heart and realize that really you feel unclean, really that your fellowship is not what it once was, and then I wonder what excuses you might give for that. You might justify your actions. Do you suppose David had ever entered into his heart and mind? And it doesn't say this here. He might have wanted to say, well, you know, Uriah, he neglected Bathsheba. I can picture him saying that. Because he has to justify, the man after God's own heart, has to justify putting to death, really killing one of his best men, a violent, vile, and terrible thing that he did to one of his best men, his mightiest of mighty men, that was on the short list of honorable men. 
well, he didn't take care of his wife like he should have. Whether that's true or not, and I suspect that's absolutely not true. Why? He was going to go back. He wasn't going to enjoy the company of his wife while his fellow men, soldiers, were in the field. He was a man of honor. But we oftentimes try to justify our actions by condemning someone else. It could be that he wanted to condemn Uriah somehow. It could be that, that uh, he formed all kinds of ideas. I don't know. He spent a year, but in all that time, it didn't restore his fellowship with God. It didn't make him feel clean. The filth was still there, even though he's still the man after God's own heart. How about, look at verse 8. Make me to hear joy and gladness. You understand that when your fellowship isn't right with God, nothing will thrill your soul. Joy and gladness are gone. Joy and gladness are gone. Now, we were without power for, what, 26, 28 hours? You know, that house, I don't know how many times we went into, I went into a room and I turned on the light switch, and it just didn't light up. And we sat in the living room, and Nora had the thing to open the garage door, and she pushed it, and I said, it's not opening. She pushed it's not opening, and then we realized, oh, that, that might be because we're without power. That's possible. And we can laugh about that. Do you understand a joyless existence is not under the shadow of the company of Jesus? You can have joy even when your heart's broken. You can have joy there. Why? If I lost the dearest thing in my life, if I lost that, I would still know that my Jesus is good to me every day. But when a man is hiding sin in his heart, he leads an existence that without, that's without joy and rejoicing. In verse 10, the last part, it says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit. He knew his spirit wasn't right. He knew his spirit wasn't right. Renew a right spirit. His spirit was defiled. Have you ever looked at what defiles your spirit? These are true when sin is reigning in your heart. Number one, jealousy. Number five, uh, numbers five, jealousy is a bad spirit. You live, a, that's a life of lack of contentment and you resent someone else having what you want. That's a poor spirit. Isn't that exactly what started this with David? He saw another man's wife and took her to himself. Jealousy. Deuteronomy 2 speaks of spirits being hardened and stubborn. Hardened spirits. The problem with letting a lack of fellowship go is it gets worse and worse and worse. Worse and worse and worse. What do they say? The Hatfields and McCoys. My son married a Hatfield. One from that genealogy. And you know what their well-known feud was all about? The death of a pig. A hog. Okay? You know, after a while, you don't even know why you're angry. After a while, you don't know what it is that keeps stirring you up. In other words, your heart gets harder and harder, and you lose sight of the, uh, of the problem, and it goes to something far worse. Sometimes that spirit is sorrowful. And if you have a joyless existence, then sorrow is going to be the order of the day. In 1 Samuel 16, evil and troubling spirit. That's what happened to Saul. Saul sat on that throne, and he'd let things build up in his head, and his heart, and he'd start, uh, an a, a evil spirit troubled him, and they brought David in to soothe his spirit with music. But your spirit can be evil and troubled all the time. And what's the fruit of that? Two different, well, I think three different times. Saul cast a spear at David twice, I believe, and once at Jonathan, his own son. How do you get there from here? You just walk in a lack of fellowship with God. Um, sadness. You know, it's how many times, how many times in Ecclesiastes, I started writing them down. Ecclesiastes 1, verse 14, verse 17, chapter 2, verse 11, 17, 26, and then I realized there's a whole bunch more. All this is vexation of spirit. Vexation of spirit. You know what it's like when your spirit's vexed? You understand that when your fellowship is wrong with God, everything can vex your spirit. 
And the only one that can do anything about your spirit is you. The only one that can identify the problem is you. Now you have the Holy Spirit of God speaking to your heart. But the only one that can do anything about it is you. Sadness. Sadness and a vexation of spirit. Lying is a spirit. Lying is a spirit. This is all just diagnosing the problem, the condition of your heart. Weakness is a bad spirit. Sometimes that spirit is hasty. In other words, it's impatient. I wonder if that was a hasty spirit when Nathan questioned him about sin and said, this man, a rich man, took one of his neighbor's, his only, his neighbor's only sheep that was like a child to him. And David jumped up and said, he'll restore fourfold. Is that kind of a hasty response? Maybe if he'd thought about it, he would realize that's exactly what he did. But Nathan said, thou art the man. Sometimes your spirit gets hasty because we judge before we know what we're talking about. Sometimes it's proud or haughty, Proverbs 16. Sometimes that spirit is broken. That's a good thing. Sometimes in Romans 8, you see a spirit of bondage and fear. Sin never gives you liberty. Sin is always something of bondage. You can't get out of it. It's like being on a merry-go-round. You can't get out of it. Bondage. And look at verse 15, and all these are verses in here. Verse 15, O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. How long has it been since you actually just praised God or even felt like singing praise to God? I think God appreciates our singing to him even when we don't have a voice. Just sing and praise to God. What is missing when you don't have congregational singing? Then it's missing the songs of praise that when you're conscious about your own voice, you can sing anyway because others cover it up. Singing praise to God. The sweet psalmist of Israel loses his song. Loses his song. We could go on and on looking at the ways to diagnose our hearts before God, our heart and our spirit. Sin breaks that unity of the spirit, doesn't it? Sin breaks that unity of the spirit. Sin breaks that fellowship. Why? Because you're probably not talking to him, though he'd love to hear you. He welcomes us back, so he's willing to listen. You won't turn to him. But you know, David goes on with confession. This is the confession of a man who really knows God. What happened for a year, maybe? He was living in his sins with his eyes down instead of looking up at the Lord again. Verse 3, I acknowledge my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. He is admitting that he sins and he has no excuse. It took him this long to come up with a confession of his sin, didn't it? And we need to pray that God would allow us to keep short accounts with him. My heart goes out to young people today. Young people today very often live a life where God's just put in the corner of our family, our home lives. What happens when you get out on your own and there's no one to pick up the pieces? You're going to have to do a crash course in learning, aren't you? He had confessed his sin and made no excuses for it. I think David's a way better man after this than he was before, and I'm not saying the sin was good. How in the world would a man who is a soldier that defeated the Goliath when he's probably a teenager, and everything else he touched, whether it's music or fighting or singing or whatever else, everything he did turned to gold, didn't it? He was humbled, wasn't he? Look at verses 3 and 4, I acknowledge my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. That means he hadn't acknowledged them before. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in the sight. You, know, you want to know why there's no song in your heart? You want to know why, why there's, uh, you feel unclean? Because you've, you have offended the holiness of God by your behavior. It, wouldn't it be wonderful if every home were a happy Christian home? Now, a happy Christian home doesn't mean that everyone's happy and everything's easy and good all the time. No, it means the foundation is always happy and you train children to get along with each other so that one day they'll get along with the people in the church and one day they'll know when there's something wrong between them and their Savior. 
he offended God. Verse 4 speaks of the evil works. He says, I've done this evil in thy sight. He calls it evil, not an aberration, not a, not a uh, mistake. The, he confesses the evil of his works. Well, you and I can say that. He committed adultery. That's one of the primary Ten Commandments, isn't it? You don't take another man's li a wife. But he committed murder, too. He committed murder, too. That wasn't because he was relaxing in the evening and he saw something he shouldn't see. That was because he was covering up a sin and he conspired to make it happen. That's evil. That's evil. Look at verse 11. Cast me not away from thy presence. You know what's, what's sad is sin in the hearts of the saints makes you insecure. Makes you insecure. Am I really saved? I really saved. Now, in the Old Testament, the Spirit came upon people and would leave them. It left Saul. He says, take not the Holy Spirit from me. That means the Holy Spirit has been with him through all of this. He didn't lose the Holy Spirit of God. But he had so turned a blind eye and a deaf ear to the Holy Spirit of God, so neglected the Holy Spirit of God, now he says, please don't take that Holy Spirit away from me. Please don't. Why? He's seriously confessing his sins. And then, look at verses 14 and 15. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation. And my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. I want you to notice the link between fellowship with God and praise of God. I suspect the only time a lot of Christians ever praise God is when they enter a church service and the song is a song of praise. Hey, it's great to say, thank you, God, for a new morning. But how about thanking God for his goodness when you don't really feel like it? When maybe you don't feel good. Maybe when things aren't going the way you want them to. That's what praise is all about, isn't it? That's what praise is all about. The link between fellowship and praise. Um, it should be that you are the best friends of the people in your church, in your family, certainly in Christendom. Your best friends there. What's happening today is churches that quit looking for souls to see them saved turn on each other. And that's a sad thing, isn't it? Happens in homes as well. There's a confession of sin, but then third, there's a conclusion. In verse 6, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. You know what that tells me? That the man after God's own heart knew inside that he was lying. He was living a lie. He acted like nothing had happened. He acted like this was a wonderful thing that now Bathsheba's his wife. But he says, God desires truth in the inward parts. That means that the inside of David had been resisting God's conviction for about a year. He desires truth, and God wants the truth. Do you excuse your behavior? What behavior do you have that you would excuse? Do you blame someone else for your behavior or maybe a lack of success? Do you ignore when God speaks to you or God speaks to you through someone else? Is your heart growing harder and harder all the time? Do you compensate for sin? You know, he says, if he'd wanted a sacrifice, I would have given it. That's not what he wanted. He wanted his heart to be right. Just giving a sacrifice doesn't fix your fellowship. What fixes your fellowship is against thee, the only of I sin and done this wickedness in thy sight. You can't compensate for that. Otherwise, you're earning God's favor. No, God, forgive me. Is arrogance a cover for behavior? Sometimes it is, isn't it? God wants the truth. God wants the humility of a broken spirit, verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken, a contrite heart, O oh God, thou will not despise. Despise means usually, it means not like we always think hate. It means that you count it of no consequence. Aren't you glad that God notices your broken spirit? your broken heart. He doesn't ignore it. And our hearts can be broken today, can't they? Our hearts can be broken. 
We have such communication that you can know what your friends are doing years later. My kids talk about their college friends, and now they've been out of college for so long that um, they're talking about friends that have kids. Jonathan probably has friends whose kids are almost teenagers, not quite. How did that happen? But with communication, you know what people all over the country, even all over the world are doing right now. And you can know what a broken heart is. My heart breaks for the burdens other people go through. Does your heart break for the burdens you go through? God wants humility and a broken spirit. No more defiance of Him. No more contention. No more self-promotion and excuses. Are you humbled? Is your spirit broken? God wants our attention. That's what fellowship is. When you wake up in the morning, is God the first one on your thoughts? Thank you, Lord, for a new day. Thank you that your mercies are new every morning. I need your mercies. Thank you, Lord, that you sustained me through the night. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings of my life, for my family, my wife, my kids. Thank you, Lord, for all those things. God wants our attention. And you turn your heart and your mind and your eyes on Jesus all the time. Fellowship, fellowship is what, I mean, I can look at my wife and she knows what I'm thinking. I don't mean all the time. She knows me. She knows me. And she knows, and she can probably do the same to me. Well, she does. She looks at me and thinks, what was I thinking? Do you understand that's what fellowship is? And I kind of make fun of it sometimes, but your fellowship with God, God shouldn't have to slap you across the head to wake you up. When sweet fellowship is there, you're kind of on the same wavelength, aren't you? Sweet fellowship. The conclusion is God wants our attention. He wants our fellowship. Just as you have the fellowship of other people, just the same. Would you be happy if your wife gave you the attention you give to God? Isn't that the best place for fellowship is in our home? If my wife copied my attention given to God and gave me that attention, would you be happy with that? You know what we as men would do? Well, I want her to devote herself to us, but we won't devote ourselves to God. wonder why she doesn't want to devote to us. You care and compassion for her. God always does that to us. Are you quick, quick to blame someone else and not repent? Let me ask you this. Would you exchange any kind of pleasure for fellowship with God? Can you really sing, he walks with me and talks with me and tells me I am his own? Isn't it wonderful that God walks with us and talks with us? And he tells us, reminds us we're his own all the time. And you can open your Bible and he'll speak to you from a verse you've read many times. And sometimes in the middle of a message, God's Spirit will tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, that's you. You know, that's not inconvenient. That's a blessing. God's still talking to you. Our worst problem, maybe or one of our worst problems is we get immune to the Spirit of God. And he has to speak louder and louder and louder. He speaks of the sacrifices of God or a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God. Thou wilt not despise the man of God's own heart. Is speaking from the perspective of maybe a year of rebellion. And he shows us what God wants from us. You want to make something different in your county or your state or your country? God's people walk with God. When you're part of what he says is, I'll tell transgressors. I'll give the gospel to transgressors. I'll speak of you to the people in the community. I will rejoice in you and people will see the rejoicing. Is that the life you live? What's your fellowship like with God? And if you walk in darkness, 1 John says, and you say you have fellowship with God, you're lying, and you make God into a liar. That means his fellowship with us is when we are in agreement with him. 
That's wonderful, isn't it? That's a good thermo thermometer for your soul. That's a good lesson to learn in our homes, to teach our children. That's what holds a church together. That's what makes us all look for the same one to return for us because we're all walking with him. That's a blessing. Where's your heart today? How healthy is your heart today? Let's pray. Lord, we sure thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Father, for this.